Hi everyone, I am Dr. Heather Hirsch. If this is your first time over on my channel, Health by Heather Hirsch, I am the clinical program director of the Menopause and Midlife Clinic at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. I absolutely love my job. Um, here on my channel, we discuss all things menopause and midlife. And in this week's video, I wanna be discussing how to keep things down there happy after and through the menopause transition. So that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Thank you all of you for subscribing to my channel. If you've watched a couple of my videos and you really wanna stick around, please go ahead and hit that bell button and subscribe and like this video if it gave you some really good information. Also, there's a couple other places you guys can follow and find me on Instagram. I'm at hormone.health.doc. On Twitter, I'm at Heather Hirsch MD. And I also have my own website, heatherhirschmd.com. It's full of tons of information, my ebook and my course. If you want to really deep dive into all things menopause, it's obviously really good. And I also have a podcast, Women's Health by Heather Hirsch. It's available anywhere where you get your podcasts. And I'm so excited to see my podcast grow in numbers and popularity. So I will link those all down below. All right, let's get into today's video. How to keep things down there pretty good after menopause. I wanna start with what this term is actually called. It is referred to by uh, physicians and NAMS practitioners as genitourinary syndrome of menopause. And it's a little bit of a mouthful. We call it GSM for short. And the old term used to be vulvovaginal atrophy. The reason it was changed is because we know that at menopause, there is changes not just to the vagina, but the entire lower genital urinary tract. And that includes the labia, the clitoris, the vulva, um, your bladder, your the urethra, so many other organs in the lower pelvic bowl. So we switched it from just calling it vaginal atrophy to GSM, genital urinary syndrome of menopause. The place where you have the most estrogen receptors is in the lower GU tract. And so at menopause, women stop making estrogen. I know this is always terribly confusing and I'm certainly happy to discuss and check patients' estrogen levels after menopause, but typically I see them between zero and 20. To give you a reference range when you were cycling and having periods, estrogen would go anywhere from 50 to 500 every month and that up and down is actually how women are or get pregnant and into the thousands if you ever had a pregnancy in your lifetime. So at menopause, we really don't make any estrogen anymore. So a reference range of zero to 20 postmenopausally is pretty common. Now, why do some women make 15 and some women make zero? There's probably some conversion from adipose tissue, fat tissue. So if you are on the heavier side, you may make some a very minuscule amounts of estrogen. And sometimes we can get some estrogen from our adrenal glands. Those are the like another little hormone gland that sit on top of our kidneys. So reference range postmenopausally is zero to 20. Now the vagina and the lower genital urinary tract in general responds very, very well to estrogen. So once estrogen's gone, things can really change in the vagina. And so this symptom, genital urinary syndrome of menopause is so common. Studies say that it affects more than 50% of women. I certainly can imagine it probably is much higher, if not 100% of women, because we're not making estrogen and that tissue is so responsive to estrogen. So if you think about the things that estrogen does in the lower GU tract, especially in the vagina, it makes that tissue nice and plush and stretchy and elastic so that it can accommodate intercourse. And also estrogen helps make this cellular layer that's responsible for lubrication and things like that, as well as maintaining the proper pH of the vagina, which is a little bit on the acidic side. And that helps us keep out infection. So it keeps urinary tract infections at bay, for example. Since we have a shorter urethra, it's really easy for bacteria to climb up and get into the bladder and cause urinary tract infections. That's why women are more prone to them than men. So at menopause, when we lose estrogen, the tissue therefore becomes 
very, very thin. It's not uh, very elastic. It no longer makes those cells that produce lubrication and the pH increases. That means it becomes more acidic. We're more prone to infections. And all of these changes can lead to some of the clinical symptoms that you feel. So the obvious one is pain with intercourse. And this can start in the perimenopause transition. It can go through menopause. And unfortunately, it is chronic and progressive. It's not going to get better and it may get worse. And I'll come back to that in a second. But not only is it just painful intercourse because our lower pelvic bowls do a lot more than just have intercourse, it can cause pain with urination that is not a urinary tract infection. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you ever thought you had a urinary tract infection because you had that pain when you urinated and you went to the doctor and they had you do a urine culture and your urine came back that said you didn't really have an infection. Well, what the heck was it? It could really be an atrophy of the urethra. So where that urethra comes out into the vagina, it could be atrophy and causing some pain when you urinate. This can even cause dryness and pain, even just walking and sitting or doing your activities of daily life. So many women report pain and dryness or lack of lubrication that's not just related to intercourse. We were made for more. <laughs> so certainly those things are really important. Now, if you are having pain with intercourse, this is also a big part of our sexual health in our sexual lives and our sexual function. You know, a lot of women come to me and say they feel like their libido has changed and they feel like it has dropped off. And so one of the things I tell my patients most commonly is the purpose of the sex drive is to reproduce. And after menopause, your body says, well, I'm no longer going to reproduce and I'm not going to spend time seeking that out like I am food, shelter, and water. And so you naturally will think about it less. If you combine that with an activity that's painful, even if you love your partner and you want him or her to, to know that you love them and you don't want to be with anyone else, if it is really painful, you're most likely not going to want to engage in that activity. And that is a survival mechanism. Your brain does not want you to engage in something that is going to hurt you. So while I kind of went over a lot of the symptoms, pain with urination, um, pain with intercourse, um, a lot of other vaginal changes, pain with sitting or standing, the vaginal intercourse part is maybe significant significant if there is also some libido issues. Now I also mentioned it's responsible for the pH. So as the vagina becomes more acidic, you can increase your chances for more urinary tract infections. Those are the kinds of painful urination that turn out to be an infection. So if you are getting multiple infections a year, this is really a sign that there are symptoms of GSM down and there, down there that we need to address. Before I get into those options, I do want to remind you that this condition is chronic and progressive, meaning unlike hot flashes, which tend to stop after a few years because the receptors in the brain that are looking for estrogen realize, you know what, I don't think it's coming back and they down regulate or they kind of go away. Those vaginal receptors in the vagina the, that are responsible for the lubrication and the elasticity of that, um, that, that tissue do not go away and therefore it typically is progressive. So if you are having these symptoms, I definitely want you to seek treatment. And the uh, purpose of this video is to go over what are the safe options for you. Now, a lot of these videos are gonna start with over-the-counter options. And you know what I'm gonna do? Not do that. I'm gonna start with vaginal estrogen preparations because their safety and efficacy is really unparalleled. We have done so many studies on vaginal estrogen and really, really found it to be extraordinarily safe. And the reason is vaginal estrogen does not go systemically. So unlike a pill or a patch or a spray or gel that I talk about in my other videos, local vaginal estrogen does not go systemically. So it is really only going to treat the lower genitourinary tract. And if you're using estrogen, 
vaginally and you have a uterus, you still don't need to take a progestin with it because it's not going to increase your risk for uterine cancer. So vaginal estrogen is so safe. We've had multiple large studies called meta-analyses where they review all of the big studies and have seen no increased risk for heart disease, um, other metabolic conditions like stroke or any type of increased risk of breast cancer or breast cancer recurrence. So there is unparalleled safety data on it. Now, unfortunately, warning, there is still a black box warning on vaginal estrogen. And this confuses a lot of my patients and scares them. The black box warning actually applies to systemic estrogen. So I want you to know that please do not actually focus on it and be sure to follow the guidance and the uh, continued messages of safety of vaginal estrogen from those of us who are menopause specialists. Now let's go briefly over some of the different types and I'm going to use their brand name and their generic name. Their generic name is what their medications are made of and the brand name is the name that you typically hear of or see of. So there is first the conjugated estrogen vaginal products and that is a Premarin and this is a cream extremely safe. There is also estradiol cream and that is called Estrace, extremely similar to <laughs> vaginal Premarin. It's just that estradiol is more of a plant-based estrogen than the conjugated estrogens which do come from horses urine. A lot of women prefer to use estradiol. I don't see a huge safety difference between the two. Again, it's just a personal preference. Now, there are also estradiol in other applications. So there is an estradiol form that is an applicator. It's a little tablet which comes with an applicator, and that brand name is called Vagifem. And there is also a new type of vaginal estrogen that comes in a little jelly bean form, and it is called Invixi. This one is quite nice because it is considered the least messiest of the cream type kinds. So one of the drawbacks is that they can be messy, especially the creams. So if that's something that bothers you, the applicator might be better. There's also Uvafem, which is also a generic form of an estradiol vaginal product. So there are many types and all of these that I just went over are prescription, but again, they are extremely safe. I want to reiterate, they will not go systemically. You do not need to use a progesterone with them and they are just so immensely helpful in reducing that pain with intercourse or dyspareunia, which is the medical term, uh, resetting the vaginal tissue so that it becomes pink and plush and you make some of your cells that make that lubrication. And just also to reset the pH so that you are less prone to urinary tract infections. In fact, my best friend, a urologist, we went to med school together, has told me on one of my podcasts on urinary tract infections, I'll link that one below, that the American Urological Association recommends vaginal estrogen for women with recurrent urinary tract infections. And it's proven to be extraordinarily helpful. So I really want you to think about a vaginal estrogen product. Now, I wanna go over uh, a different type, and this is called parasterone. And parasterone is vaginal DHEA. DHEA is something that you can get probably at Whole Foods and take orally over the counter. It converts intracellularly deep in the cells into estrogen and a little bit of testosterone. Previously, I would have to get this compounded, but it is now commercially available. And again, the name for that is parasterone. Its brand name is Interosa. Now, if all of those uh, are difficult for you to use because you don't like touching the vagina, you don't like putting things in the vagina, you don't like the mess, there is an oral medication called Ospemifem. Ospemifem is a serum that means it acts like estrogen in some tissue and unlike estrogen in other tissues. So it acts like estrogen at the level of the genital urinary system and the vagina and actually at your bones, but not like estrogen and in the uterus. So again, you don't need to take a progestin with it and probably unlike estrogen at the breast tissue. So it is a really great underutilized option in my opinion. 
This is a once-day daily oral, oral medication FDA approved for painful intercourse. And the way it's going to work is to do all of the same types of things that the vaginal estrogen products do and that the parasterone does. So there's certainly a lot of different options. And I really want you to know there are different options because there are women who say that they don't continue to use their vaginal estrogen product because they don't like it. I absolutely get it. It's, it's, it's cumbersome. You have to form a new habit. You have to do it at bedtime. And so there are some barriers. I want to let you know a couple questions that I get in the office from my patients. And the first question is, will this affect my partner if they get it on them? The answer is no. If again, these levels of estrogen are so, so small that if someone were to get it on them, it would have a null effect. Can you use it before intercourse? You can, you might not want to just because it is a little bit messy, but certainly nothing would really happen. I usually tell my patients, use it on your least sexy nights like Monday and Thursday. A lot of these are prescribed two times a week. Now, another thing people ask me is, can I use it more than two times a week? Yeah, you absolutely can. Again, these medications are so safe. So if you want to use something like, you know, uh, the estradiol applicator called Vagifem three or four times a week, you absolutely can. And you would want to have your healthcare provider write it for you that way. A lot of people ask me, should I check my estrogen levels when we're on these? And actually the guidelines say you do not need to do that. Now let's talk about estrogen levels since we're here Many studies have shown that when we check blood levels of estradiol in women on vaginal estrogen products, their levels are within 0 and 20. So if you are listening to me through this whole video, you know that that is the normal reference range for women who are postmenopausal. That means that serum estrogen level overall is really, really, really low. So those are some of the common questions that I get about vaginal estrogen products. Now, if you don't want to use these, you can also consider moisturizers and lubricants. You can get these over the counter. I have some linked on my Amazon account, which I will link down below some of my favorite over the counter moisturizers and lubricants. And what those are going to do is essentially band aid the tissue, right? They're going to help maybe during intercourse, but they're not going to change the underlying pathophysiology or the underlying anatomy or structure of the tissue after you lose your estrogen at menopause. And finally, I want to end this video with what can you do if you are a breast cancer survivor or a gynecologic cancer survivor? Well, a huge study in the Cleveland Clinic came out showing the safety of vaginal estrogen products for women with gynecologic cancers, and we're talking ovarian and endometrial cancer. And what about breast cancer? Well, this is actually a very hot topic because there are now some menopause specialists and some breast cancer doctors who do agree, agree that there is a, a, a phenotype of a breast cancer survivor who would be potentially a good candidate for some of these products because they are so low and because they really stay locally and they don't go systemically. Certainly, if this has affected your quality of life, if this has affected your sexual function, if it's causing depression, if it's causing low self-esteem and you are a breast cancer survivor, <laughs> There are definitely some kinds of breast cancer survivors who would be fairly good candidates for local vaginal estrogen, including those with DCIS, stage one or stage two breast cancers, those cancers who have, uh, those women with cancers who have been in recurrence for many time, those women who've had no lymph node involvement with their cancers, and certainly uh, it is always the best if you are a doctor who is thinking and talking to you about your estrogen product, discusses this in a really constructive conversation with your medical oncologist so that everyone is in agreement because you always want everyone to be on the same page. So just a bit of that for my special population. 
All right, guys, I will let you go. And I just wanted to give you one final message, which is if your vaginal estrogen is not helping your symptoms, then this is the point where you might want to consider systemic estrogen and progestin if you have an intact uterus. And yes, Hormone therapy is FDA approved for severe genital urinary syndrome of menopause. So I have many patients who start with vaginal estrogen products and unfortunately they don't sufficiently solve the problem and they do go on to use systemic hormone therapy. I have a whole playlist on hormone therapy. I will link it right up here. You can check that out down below and so much more to come here on this channel. Thank you guys for listening into this video. I know my dog's been barking in the background. I wish I could do something. I need a dog walker for when I'm filming. That's what I need. But thank you again. Please subscribe to my channel. It really helps me know that you like this content and that I should take time out of my week to do this. I really love your comments and your suggestions and anywhere that you leave them, whether it's down below on my Instagram, you know, I really thrive off getting the information out to you that you need. As always, this is not direct medical advice. This is purely for educational um, background. It is my mission to improve uh, menopause awareness and education around these types of um, issues which are often under discussed at your doctor's appointment or among friends and education for our physicians is still quite lagging. So thank you guys again so much for your continued support and go ahead and check out those playlists that I have down below for you and I will see you next week. Bye!